I'm Bill Venners, and uh, I ran up here to change the, uh, the title here because I, I did just give this in London last Friday. I told Alexi that it would be practice for tonight. So you guys, you know, it's not, you're not getting this cold. I have actually done it once. Uh, and what, uh, what I wanted to talk about was uh, what I have learned over time uh, doing Scala tests, essentially. And um, it all goes back to this person. Uh, does anybody know who that is? Anybody recognize him? This is the person that uh, first introduced object-oriented programming to me. It was a younger version. He looked a lot younger back then. It was way back in, I have to think when it was, the late 80s, I think. I was at a company in, in Santa Clara, Kaylee Instruments, and we were all C programmers, and we wanted to use this new language called C++. We decided to use that in a project. So they, no one knew object-oriented programming or C++, so they brought in some expert from the outside, so-called expert. Um, and it was a guy named Bertrand Meyer, who is a French guy who, who designed Eiffel, and he wrote this book, uh, which uh, is really seen as one of the major books in uh, uh, sort of defining what object-oriented programming meant. <coughs> and uh, so he, he actually taught me, you know, first time I heard about subtyping or inheritance and that sort of stuff uh, in that course. And it was, you know, for him, I think he was, you know, it was a course on C++, but he talked a lot about Eiffel because he thinks it's better, right? Um, so he, you know, he, he, his, his language didn't sort of take off as a mainstream language. But if you look at this book, uh, I, I reread it, parts of it recently, just to uh, prepare for this talk. And I was amazed at how many things he sort of figured out. So a lot of what he, he figured out did actually get adopted. Um, but one of them that he, he, uh, he did uh, sort of define was this thing called design by contract. How many people have heard of design by contract? Have you heard of that? Yeah, OK. So you've heard of it. It came from this guy, Bertrand Meyer. And what, uh, what he said is he's trying to figure out how to define that software is correct. And what he said is this is how you decide if software is correct. <laughs> PAQ. And what, what P is, is it's an assertion, and Q is an assertion. So he also sort of defined what assertion meant and fleshed out what that meant. Um, and that it, and this thing called an exception gets thrown if an assertion fails. He sort of like defined that. And what uh, P is, is, is a kind of assertion called a precondition. And Q is a kind of assertion called a postcondition. And then A is an action. So it's like something you do. So if you call a method, there's a precondition assertion. Then there's an action. And then there's a postcondition assertion. So an example of it <coughs> is the precondition might be x is greater than or equal to 9. And then an action would be uh, add 5 to x. And then a postcondition assertion is x is less than or equal to 13. So anybody know what 9 plus 5 is? It's actually not 13. 14, 14 yeah. So <coughs> this actually isn't, I mean, if you wanted to stick with 9 as your precondition, you could change this to 14 and it would still be correct, right? So if x greater than or equal to 14 is the postcondition, that says that there's one more value. Let's see, is that one more value is allowed? x greater than or equal to 13 allows 13. x greater than or equal to 14 doesn't allow 13. So that means there's one less value. And that makes it stronger. right? So you can strengthen an, an assertion or, or weaken it. So over here, if you stick with 13, you could actually make that x greater than or equal to 8. right? Uh, so x greater than or equal to 8 means that uh, 8 works now, but it didn't before. So that's one more, that's one more uh, value, so it's weaker. Is that right? I actually got this completely wrong in London. In other words, uh, if, it, if it allows more values, then it's a weaker assertion. It's easier to achieve. If it allows fewer values, it's a stronger assertion. It's harder to achieve. Right? That's his idea. And one of the ideas of design by contract is that if, uh, if an, and a precondition is weaker, it's easier t for the client, uh, the person calling the method. Um, it, but it's, it's harder for the person providing the method because they have more to worry about. And so one person's obligation is, a, is another person's benefit. So design by contract was, was the idea that there's, there's two parties to every method. There's the person who writes the method, who provides it, and there's the person who calls the method 
who uses it. And an obligation for one is a benefit for the other. So if, if the post condition is strong, then that's harder for the person writing the method to achieve, so it's an obligation, but it's, it's less to worry about for the caller, right? So one person's obligation is another person's benefit, and that's, uh, it's uh, fundamental to design by contract is, is the idea that deciding who is de who's uh, responsible for what, right? So the, the, uh, the preconditions are the responsibility of the caller, that's their job to get that right. And the post conditions are the responsibility of the, the person providing the method. OK, so that's PAQ. And if you take that to the limit, false is the hardest to achieve assertion. So that's the strongest one. And true is the easiest to achieve assertion. You don't have to do anything. Anything's true. I mean, if the assertion is true, I mean, that, that's what it is, then you don't have to do anything to achieve it, right? OK, so the deal uh, with assertions is in, in Eiffel, so this is the Eiffel programming language, which is, was you know, Bertrand Meyer's language, because he's French. He named it after the Eiffel Tower. Um, just look like this, they're Boolean expressions. So n greater than zero means if someone's passing n in, it has to be greater than zero. And then x does not equal void is like saying x is non-null. And then a semicolon separates them. So in a semicolon is a statement separator, just like in uh, jo uh, Scala. Uh, but it, in, in, the, in the context of assertions, it was an implicit and. So all the little pieces of the individual parts of the precondition are anded together. They all have to be true for, the, for P to be true, right? to be a, a past. And so one of the things that he, he had in Eiffel years ago, before it was cool, is semicolon inference. So just like in Scala, if you have a return there, you can leave off the semicolon. And then. But these are still implicitly anded together. N has to be both greater than zero and x has to not be, not be null. And then in his, in Eiffel, you could label these. And the reason is that what happens when an assertion fails, when it's false, is an exception is thrown at runtime. And so you get a stack trace, but if there's a whole bunch of assertions, let's say there's 10 of them, you don't know which one failed unless you have a little note saying, oh, by the way, n was not greater than zero or the non-positive one failed. So that's that is uh, what positive is for. It's not so much to say, by the way, n greater than zero means positive, because that's kind of obvious. You could just see n greater than zero and know that. It's more when that fails, that it was this part of the thing, not the rest. OK. So that was uh, in Eiffel back in those days. And this is how a function or a method looked. He didn't call them methods, but uh, the same thing in Eiffel. Um, he's got a name up there, square root takes a real number, which is like a double, and the result is uh, double. And that, look at that. That looks a lot like Scala. There's a colon and a, and a type, right? Um, and then is is like the equal sign. This is now this is the body. But he had always had three parts. Um, he had a require section, which was the precondition. He had a do dot, 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 which is the, the action, the A. And then there's an ensure clause, which is the post condition. So he really formalized that in the language that you actually have to write those, those three pieces when you make a function or a method. And um, so here it's a square root. So the uh, x has to be greater than 0 or equal to 0 because, because for a square root, you can't take the square root of a negative number. right? So that's your precondition. And that's the responsibility of the caller, the client. And then the dot, dot, dot is left as an exercise for the reader because it wouldn't fit on the slide. And I don't know actually how to implement that. Um, and then there's the ensure. And here, because it's actually uh, floating point math, uh, it can't be exact. So what he does is check for correctness within a tolerance. So if you, if you take the result, which is the candidate square root uh, that's been computed by the do part, and you multiply it by itself, so you square it, and if you subtract the original, it, in math, it would just be 0 if it's correct. Right? That's all you need to check. But in uh, in, in, in a floating point math, it might be a rounding slightly different, right? So what he does is he takes the absolute value to make sure that that rounding difference is positive, and then he just makes sure it's within some tolerance that he cares about, however that's defined. And that's his post condition. And so that was how you write a method in, uh, in Eiffel. <clears throat> you have to have the P and the A and the Q. OK, so, so essentially the idea of this contract is that that uh, 
it's the, the idea of there's two different roles, and these are people's roles, the person who, call, who writes the method and the person who calls the method. Um, so if I'm writing the square root method, then I'm providing it to you. And so what I promise, you know, my, the contract or the deal between us is that if you give me good data, then I'll give you good data, essentially. If you give me a number greater than or equal to zero, something that passes the precondition, then I promise to give you something that approximates the square root of that number within a tolerance. And that, that uh, the, the actual uh, specification of what that method does is, is this require and ensure clause. It sort of actually specif that that's the specification of if the method actually does that, then it is correct. Sort of specifies what it has to do, and it can test that it does it, right? So another thing that he had uh, in, in, in sort of fleshed out back th way back then was uh, that assertions are, you know, first of all, they, they throw an exception. So that's not something you want to actually get at runtime. And it may take time to do this computation here. I'm mean, squaring something and subtracting, and maybe it won't take that much time, but it might take some time. So you could turn them off in Eiffel in a very fine-grained way. So on a class-by-class -class basis, you could control which assertions execute and don't. So you can say, hey, run everything when I'm developing and testing, but turn off certain ones when I'm in production, uh, once I'm confident it's going to work. Um, and the default in Eiffel was that if you didn't say anything, the default you would get is, is the ensure clause would not execute, and the require clauses would execute. Right, that was the default. You check the preconditions always, but you don't check ever post conditions. Um, OK. So there was one other, well, there's actually more than one kind of assertion that he talks about. Uh, the main other one was called an invariant. And so it, this is, if you just look at functional, like just functions, pure functional programming, you don't have to worry about invariants because you just have functions. And that precondition and postcondition is enough. But in an in a object program, you have a class, right? And a class has some data in it usually. And so that data may have uh, requirements that like one of the variables is always twice the other one, or one of them is the Roman numeral version of the other one, or something like that. So if that should always be true, something that should always be true about the data of the object is called an invariant. And he had a way to express that in Eiffel also. And then he would check that. He would add them to the preconditions and the post conditions of any public method. So to the way that in, in, in Eiffel a method was deemed correct is if the preconditions and invariants succeed, then after you execute the body, that the post conditions and invariants must succeed. And if it does, then it's correct. So that's, that's like a definition of what software correctness means. When you start doing functional programming, and, and ob, you know, like Scala has a lot of immutable objects, you wouldn't really have to worry about the invariants except at the end of the constructor. So once you construct an object to ver guarantee that it's in a valid state to start with, you check the invariants, but after that it can't change, so you don't need to worry about it after that. So it would just be pre, you know, P uh, A Q after that. So, okay. So um, you can actually do this kind of thing in Scala if you want, the design by contract thing. So I'm going to give you a little demo of that. I mean, first of all, what I what I decided to do is write a square root since he had, this is like that stuff came from his book, from his examples. Um, what uh, Scala has, let me just demo Scala square root, um, which just, it just calls the Java one. Um, if you say math dot, I just started this REPL, so I think I have some Scala test stuff in it, but it's just uh, math, Scala dot math dot square root of uh, 9.0. You know, you take a double number, it's 3.0, right? Or if I say of 4, I get the square root of 4 is, well, that's 2. Let's get the square root of 2. That's more interesting. There you go. There's an interesting one. So that's an approximation, right? Uh, probably goes on a little longer than that. If you pass a negative number, you, there is no such thing as a negative, the square root of a negative number. What this guy gives you is not a number. So what I want to do is write a square root that throws a legal argument exception, right? So that's the difference. So my square root function uh, takes a double, and it says, assume 
x is greater than or equal to 0 and x is non-positive. So I'm going to show you what happens when I take the square root of uh, infinity. Anybody know what happens if I take the square root of infinity? And that's called double dot uh, positive infinity. You know what I get? <laughs> yes, that's right. The square root of infinity is obviously infinity. So maybe that's correct. I don't know. But I kind of don't like it. I, it seems like I've overflowed. So I'm going to actually disallow that in my method also. So this assume clause is my precondition. And assume is a method in Scala.preda, in pre-def, the little pre-def object that's imported implicitly. Um, it does exactly the same behavior as assert, but in, it, it is intended for preconditions especially. So I'm assuming that this is true in my method, is what that says. Um, and so let me demo assume. Um, so I'm going to have to say, because I've imported Scala tests, I'm going to have to say pre-def. I'll do assert first. Let's make a value. x equals 33. Uh, pre-def dot assert, uh, assert, x is, let's say something that will work, x is greater than zero. So what assert did, does, is it returns the unit value to mean pass, right? It worked. That indicates success. So if you have something that fails, it throws assertion error, right? Assume does the exact same thing, but it, it gives a slightly different uh, error message. Um, if it fails, instead of saying assertion failed, it says assumption failed. Um, but it, it's an assertion error. And both of these, just like Bertrand Meyer sort of defined in, in Design by Contract in Eiffel, can be elided at runtime. So you can set an elide level when you compile Scala code, and it won't actually run those. Right? So that's, uh, that's the Design by Contract idea. Um, and then this ensuring thing is also in pre-def. And the way that works is you call it on something. So math.square root of x, basically if I pass my precondition, I can just return the result of calling math square root. That's what I want to return. The whole point of this function is just to like, throw an exception on those preconditions. Otherwise, I, I'm, okay, I'm happy with what math square root says. But just to sort of do the, pre the post condition, I say ensuring. And what that is is implicitly added to everything. So I can call ensuring on anything. So I'm calling it on the result. And then what ensuring does is it passes the result into this function, which is the next thing you put. And that's where you do your assertion. So what I did is I, I do this ULP gives you the distance between the, this double and the next one. And I use that as the tolerance check. Um, and so then I just do his, his same thing. You, you square res, you subtract x, you take the absolute value, make, which makes it positive, and you make sure it's less than or equal to the tolerance. And that actually passes. Um, so um, let me demo ensuring real quick. I can say x, x is 33, right? So I could say x ensuring, and then the, you know, the thing, basically 33 is going to be passed in here. And so I could just say if x is greater than 0, that's going to pass my assertion. So instead of throwing, returning the unit value here, it actually returns what you called ensuring on so that it will be return from the method, right? Because right here, the last thing that's going to happen is the result of ensuring, and that's what gets returned. So if it, the, the assertion passes, you want to return whatever ensuring was called on, right? So if you call ensuring on, on 22, then the whole thing returns 22 if the assertion passes. But if it doesn't pass, then you get an assertion error. Um, so this can also be elided, except the function call doesn't actually get elided. It actually does call that function. But on the inside, it doesn't do anything. It just always passes. Uh, so um, this, by the way, was something we added when we were writing the first edition, because it didn't exist. And, and we were talking about design by contract in the book. And so there was an assume, but there was no ensuring. So um, Martin invented one, and then we wrote about it. And then there was a bit of, uh, it was one of the uh, few times that we had a bit of a disagreement. Lex Spoon, the other author, and I sort of were debating, do you use the design by contract way, the assume way of uh, doing preconditions, or do you do the Java way? Because in Java, it's a little bit different. Java always would throw an illegal argument exception. They would not elide it. You couldn't like elide it. And you didn't throw assertion error for that. Like a precondition check in Java was kind of part of the contract. If you give me a negative number to my square root, I will throw illegal argument exception, or you know, in this case, 
that's what I'm doing, right? So that's, we also added require at that time, um, which looks like uh, this. And it, it's the same behavior, except it doesn't throw assertion error, and it can't be elided. It throws illegal argument exception. So if I say, instead of assert, assume, uh, I, I say require, I get requirement failed. So here, one of the things that I did in Scholactic, which uh, Scholactic is a library that came out of, kind of grew out of Scala test. There were things people asked for in Scala test that they also asked for that they could use it in their production code. There are a few things. So I made this sister library that is released at the same time called Scholactic. And so one of the things I put in there was uh, requirements, because if you use um, Scholactic requirements, you get the uh, error message. Basically, you don't ever want a requirement to fail because you've just, you know, something blew up at runtime. And something that's a, you basically discovered a bug. Um, but um, if it does, you want a nice error message because that's like forensic clues that's it's in the log file that helps the, the you know, a human has to come and try to figure out what went wrong and fix a bug in the code if that happens, right? So um, if I use the, the scholastic require, then you actually get. 33 was not less than zero. The same kind of error message you get when an assertion fails in Scala test. Okay, so uh, so that's require, and what I think you know, there's a lot of things in in. Oh yes, sorry. Uh, question. Question. Is it possible in Scala to just like not go like do a blow up, but just like catch the error, but also log it out in some way to kind of like. Yes. Yeah, the question was, uh, can you catch an error and log it out rather than blow up? Um, yeah, you can with a catch clause. And then, yeah, but you can do that. No. Um, it's not built into Scala other than it, it Scala's on the JVM. And the JVM does, I think, allow you to like, define as a configuration the default catch for a thread, maybe. Uh, that might be a, true, but that's on the JVM. That's not really Scala. And normally what you do is like if you're a, a web framework and a request comes in and then whatever that does blows up, you don't actually just die. You catch it and you log it out and then you continue with the next request. So, okay, so anyway, uh, I think when I, when I met Bertrand Meyer, he was a little bit frustrated because he had, designed, he had just done this amazing sort of intellectual, he came up with all these things and people didn't use Eiffel. Right, they use C++. And he, I think it's like, oh. So uh, when I was reading that, his book, I, again, just to prepare for this talk for London, I was like, wow, you know, he actually sort of figured out a lot of things before they were popular. Like he talked about the, the assertions as how you specify the software. And, and that was way before BDD. It's like, hey, test our specifications. And he even talked about, well, maybe you write the specification first. Way before TDD was like going around saying, hey, write your tests first. So he, he I think, came up with a lot of stuff that maybe he doesn't get credit for. Um, so maybe he should. But uh, one of the things that I think sort of fit in that category of nice idea but didn't quite take off was designed by contract. It just really didn't get adopted. It was in Eiffel. Eiffel didn't sort of take off. And you know, it wasn't in Java. Um, it's not in Scala, except this sort of lightweight thing in pre-def that people don't tend to use. And I think what did win instead was test-driven development. So Kent Beck came out, and, and he's just a really good marketeer. He'll go to lots of conferences, give lots of exciting talks about this thing, like you should write a test first. You should never write a bit of production code until you've had a test, right? And it's kind of in the same space. And I think what happened was that, um, I'll show you a, a, a demo. What happened was that uh, instead of uh, four and six, I actually, four and five, okay, go to four. There it is. Um, we do do the precondition. So that part did happen, right? But for post-condition checks, instead of doing it in the code, we would do it off to the side in test code. So you do those assertions in tests instead of right in the method. So the insurings we just didn't do in practice. Most people don't do that. But they actually do something like them over in the test. So if you look at this test, I'm making a, you know, I create a, 
I, I call square root of 1, and then I say it should equal 1. Well, that's actually the post condition check. And then I do it for a few other examples, right? 4 and 9. I know those, and so I do that. But what that doesn't capture is what the full specification of what uh, design by contract did. Um, it, it does kind of say it in English. So that was one thing that, that tests added to, is you, you do have an English or a human language. It may not be English, but expression of what the specification is. Like the, the square root function should compute this. I mean, I should be more, I should say within a particular tolerance or whatever it is, right? But uh, so there's a specification there. But what is missing from here is that if you look back at the, the uh, if I go back to, um, let's use this one. Like, um, well, no, I think right here. Essentially, this requirement and, and ensure clause is supposed to hold for any value of x that's passed in, right? So it's, there's a for all missing. And so really sort of take this and move it to a test, you need a for all. So what, what that looks like uh, is number, let me go back down to 6, I think, 5. My 5 looks like a 6, but it's a 5. Um, so instead of this, like, I just try three things. If you use property-based testing, you can say for all x's that are of type double, uh, whenever x is greater than or equal to 0 and x is not positive infinity, then calling the square root of x should equal uh, math that square root of x. And so what, what I did is I got rid of the tolerance. I just said, actually, this one should exactly return that. That's my specification. It should return exactly the same value as long as the preconditions set. And then I check the preconditions farther down to make sure they throw an Ill illegal argu argument exception if they fail. But that actually is PAQ because um, the precondition is the whenever clause. And then the action, the A, is calling square root. And then the Q is the should equal thing. So that actually moves the whole specification over. OK. Um, all right, let me go back to this guy. Um, <clears throat> so, in, so what kind of won in the marketplace of ideas was instead of this PAQ in the body of the method, where you have a require clause and an ensuring clause, what we do is we say PA true in the method. So remember, true is the one that's really easy to, to sort of achieve. No matter what you return, it's the Wild West, it will succeed, right? So that's what we say in, in, in practice. That's what won. We do check preconditions. We don't take them out, which was the default in Eiffel. We don't check in uh, post conditions ever, which was also the default in Eiffel. Um, but we have this thing off to the side where there is an English or human language statement of the specification. And then you can do the post You basically do the post condition checks over there. That's what happened. So I think in the marketplace of ideas, that's what won. Um, but you need a for all. So I mean, basically, to get the same kind of level of specification in a test that you got to design by contract, you need a for all in the test. So I think that's really fundamental part of testing. And then the A really in the test becomes part of the Q, right? So the, the P in that one whenever clause is, you know, as long as x is greater than 0 and x is positive infinity, that's the P part. Um, but then if you look, the, the a kind of just gets blended in with the q. I say square root of x should equal x. I mean, the a is the square root, but it's not a sep separate thing. The reason it was separate in Eiffel is because he had a do part, right? He had to actually implement the body of the method. We just have to call it, right? So what that actually looks like is uh, predicate logic. Uh, it looks like this thing down here, px implies qx. And what, what that is is a, it's, a, it's a thing in math where uh, if x is a, is a member of the set of all doubles, it has some domain. Uh, p of x is x is positive and not infinite. qx is the square root of x computes the same value as Scala math square root of x. Um, and the way you write that is this in, in predicate logic. And what, what predicate logic has is it's, it's like Boolean, with a few, Boolean logic with a few extra things. Um, just like Boolean, there's an and, that little it looks like an A without the, they forgot the middle dash part. That's and, uh, also called conjunction. And then if you turn it upside down, that's or. It's called disjunction. Um, same thing as two pipes in, in Boolean, right? And then the sideways L 
uh, looks like the, the name of a ranch. That's actually not. So that's excavation point and Boolean. And then you have variables. In predicate logic, you actually have variables, you can x, y, z, whatever you want to call them, and they stand for some value in a domain. So you know, we could think of the domain of real numbers. Those are like in math, that's like infinite. But in programming, you might think of it as doubles. Um, and then p, q, those are predicates, and they take variables, one or more, and return true or false. So that's like a predicate function in Scala. It takes one or more variables and returns true or false. We call that a predicate. Um, and then you can have regular functions, which is uh, fg, whatever, you know, fgh. They take variables, one or more, and return a value of a codomain. So it might be another real number or whatever, right? Um, that's just like regular functions in Scala. And then you have these two other quantifiers. One's the universal quantifier that looks like an upside down a, and that sort of means for all. And the existential quantifier is a backwards e, that means there exists. So then you can write formulas in these things. So this uh, upside down a, x, upside down y, p, x, y, that means for all x and y, for all y, uh, p holds for x, y. That's what that means in predicate logic. And then the second one is for all x, there exists a y such that p holds for x, y. Right? You can make statements like that. And then there's two others that, two other symbols that are common that can be uh, expressed in terms of the, the previous ones. The right arrow is a conditional. It means if then. Essentially, it's how you say if then in predicate logic. Uh, it also is called implication. Um, and it just means if the, the left thing is true, if the thing to the left of the arrow is true, like f implies g means if f is true, then g is true, right? if then. Um, and you can actually um, implement that with these pre, you know, the previous slide's symbols by saying not f or g, right? That actually implements f implies g. And then the arrow going in both directions is called biconditional or its equivalent. And that's when f and g have to have the same value. So if f is true, g is true. If f is false, g is false. They, they are equivalent to each other. Um, so you can also implement that in terms of the earlier operators. And that, that means if and only if. Right? So that's how you say these things in predicate logic. And so what, um, what uh, oh, let me back up. What uh, basically the, this PAQ actually maps to is, is that statement of predicate logic. PX is a predicate. It's going to be true or false. And if that's true, that implies that QX will be true. That's the correctness formula in logic is correctness formula. OK, so one of the other things that uh, had always puzzled me or I thought about um, over the years with Scala test was, uh, what, what's the type of a test? Um, and what I finally kind of came up with is that it's, in, it's type assertion, because it's the type of Q. You know, the sort of P x implies qx. The last thing you do is qx. That's, that result is what the type of a test is. And so in, in Scala test 2.0, we added this, this uh, uh, type alias called assertion, which is equal to the singleton type for succeeded. And so I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, so in, if I just, I'm going to now, it's, I think I actually, if I say assert, I get what is x? x is 33, right? So if I say assert x is less than 0, I get test failed exception. So that's Scala test assert, because you get an error message and a test failed exception. So if you say x is greater than 0, which will, which will succeed, um, what you get back as of 2.0 is, is succeeded. So what's kind of weird about the type of a test is that what you get from pre-defs assert and assume and Scala tests prior to 2.0's assert uh, and, and, and assume, there's an assume in there, was a unit value. It's a singleton object. Um, now you get the succeeded singleton object because there's, you know, if the thing passes, you don't really want to know anymore. So it's kind of the opposite of production code. Usually when some, the happy thing is you want some information back and it's an error if you don't get it. Like sum and none in option, usually it's good news to get a sum and bad news to get a none. Here it's like it's good news to get the none. I'm not getting anything. But if it fails, now I want information. I want to know a stack trace. I want to know an error message. You know, I want to know what happened. Um, 
so it's also, I think, whenever an assertion fails, it represents a bug has been discovered. So you don't want to proceed. It's not, a bug is not something the program can recover from. So uh, you actually want the program to, to terminate right there. And because otherwise, it could do more damage. And if it blows up later, you might not be able to track back of where it started. Um, so uh, I think you know, when you're running a test, it really usually, you do usually want it to throw an exception and fail fast because there's no, often no point going further in the test. You'll just get, everything will fail after that. Uh, you may as well just blow up. Um, so what happens is if, if uh, you always get succeeded, it says a cert's always going to return succeeded. It just, sometimes it'll blow up with test failed exception. So that's, that's what the type of a test became in Scala test. Um, but what I, I kind of had always, thought might be, I mean, if the type of a test is assertion, then should the type of this, this, this curly braces it, whether you put the body of a test, require type assertion. And sometimes people have like forgotten to say assert and they just put Boolean and that's a bug. But it's not caught by the type checker because anything goes. Basically, the type of a test in Scala test has always been any. Um, and, but it just, People do all kinds of stuff in tests. They're kind of sloppy. They just want to get stuff done. So they'll do things like uh, print a debug message or write to a file and then look at the file. And that's the last thing in the test. Or they, you know. And then there's assertions where like intercept returns the exception. If it actually, if you intercept you know, whatever exception, it returns it. So if that's the last thing in your test, actually that's type exception, not type assertion. So that would not type check and it'd be a pain, right? So I never did change that, and I'm not going to because there's just every, sort of like it's actually quite practical to have type any. But what I've considered for years, and I finally decided to put in, was a, another batch of styles where the type is assertion. So those are going to be called logic styles. They'll come in in uh, 3.2, so sometime next year probably. Uh, whoops, what was the number? Yeah, here's one. Um, uh, let's go to nine. That's what I want. That was my right here. Here's an example. This is a logic fun spec. If you stick the word logic in front of it, what happens is now it's the same thing as fun spec, except that the type of the test is assertion. So if I were to put my print line here, uh, you're going to get this annoying warning. Uh, oh, it's very teeny tiny print too. That's annoying. It says expression of type unit doesn't conform to the expected type skull test assertion. Um, and what you'll have to do if you really want to print that is you'll have to say some kind of su assertion. So we added succeed in 2.0. That just returns a succeeded singleton. Um, and that's kind of a pain. But it would catch if you accidentally forgot to say assert at the end. If what you did was instead of assert x greater than zero, you just said x greater than zero, then it now becomes a type. Well, there's no x. That's also a type error. But it would be a type error. Let's say, would this work? Three greater than zero. OK, see, there I forgot assert, and it gives me that same type error. So anyway, uh, that's one thing that's coming in 3.2. Um, OK. So um, the other thing that I like to suggest when people use a require, I think it's good to use a require to fail fast. And you don't take them out. So it really gives you predictable behavior when, when a bug is encountered um, and you get you know, hopefully good uh, stack trace and error message in the log file. Um, but it's a, every require is a potential place where things could explode, right? And so if you want to try to make your software more robust, it's good to think about, can I get rid of the require by moving that constraint into the type itself, right? So here, I'm taking any old double, but I'm saying the double can't be positive, and it has to be greater than or equal to 0. Can I move that into the type? So I started in, in Scalactic adding these thing called any vowels. So there's one called Posey double. It was named, uh, since this is San Francisco, I can say that I, I named it after Buster Posey. Because I kind of did. Because it was hard to come up with like something that was obviously had zero in it and positive. Because positive is usually no, above zero. Um, but anyway, uh, once I say that, I can actually remove the x greater than or equal to zero from my precondition, making that weaker because I made the type stronger. Um, 
So sometimes it's practical to do that. Maybe it isn't. But I think it's good every time you write a require to like think, well, can I move this into the type? Right? Um, so uh, let me just show you what, how those guys work. So what, what these guys do, I'm going to show you pause end, um, positive integer. That's in any vowels. Um, so if I say pause int 33, I get one. And this is an any vowel, so it's really just an int 33. So it, it would hopefully be as efficient as int. It's not boxed unless it needs to be boxed. Well, int isn't boxed unless it needs to be boxed. So if you put ints in a list, they get boxed. If you put pause ints in a list, they get boxed. But if just right there it didn't get boxed, it's just an int, right? And all the methods on it are really behind the scenes static methods that take an int. Um, so, so anyway, I get one. If I put a negative number, I actually get a compiler error. So the, this apply method is a macro that can look at literals and say, well, you're valid or not. And if you're not valid, it actually throws an assertion at compile time, which becomes a compiler error. Basically, it's a compile time assertion. Uh, so you can't get one uh, with a literal at compile time. I won't compile. But the, the downside of that is if I, I, do I have an x? So I have an x equal to 33. If I say pause int x, then I get another compiler error because, because it's not a literal. I can't tell at compile time. I can't prove that it's actually positive, even though it is. So the compiler error says use a different factory method called from. So from is a, an alternate factory method that returns a uh, option. So what, what happened there was I was trying to help people get rid of requires, and I didn't want to just move the problem. So I didn't give you a way to get an exception. So you can, if it's a literal, you can get one without pain if it's valid. Um, but if it's not a literal, you have to deal with an option, right? So you don't, you'd have to like say, oh, if it's if it's a valid, if it's a sum, that means I got one. If it's a none, that I didn't. But what I, I mean, I did that in I can't remember when that came out, but since then I've been using it uh, myself, and I've kept finding that I I needed to call dot get on that option. <laughs> so. That, that might be worse. So what, uh, what an example of it is, um, if you look at the, the Scala doc for scala.math.square root, it's non-existent. So if you look at the source code, it says, I'm calling java.lang.math.square root. So you go look at that, and it says, I will return a positive number. Right? So I believe, I have confidence, that when I call you know, scala.math.square root, that it will always return a positive number. So why not actually return a posy double? Right? So, uh, so let's just change the result type to posy double. The problem is math at squared of x is not a literal, so I, can't, I have to use that from method. So that was an example of like, I would end up doing that. I found myself doing that. And I was trying to be idealistic, I think. Like, you know, I don't want, you to, I don't want to give you a, a way to replace a require, which would blow up with an exception, with something else that would blow up with an exception. But I, I, I realized that you know, in practice, it's just you, you need one because I, was, I kept needing it. So then I started thinking about what should I call it. And then I thought, well, how about uns I, the one I kicked around the most was unsafe from because no one wants to have the word unsafe in their code. So they might, it would discourage its use. But then I, it actually hit me that it's an assertion. Um, because I, but it's a new kind of assertion. It's an assertion. Uh, it's me asserting that I, I believe it's going to work. See, right here, I do believe that's going to work because I, have, I believe in, I have faith in the con that, that Java will always, its square root will bring turn a positive number. So I think it's always going to work. And that's what I, I, I usually thought that it was right, that we put our assertions in tests, not in production code. And I never used assert in production code. I never used assuring. I would put assert in the tests. But this kind of assertion, I think, actually gives you something more than other kinds of asserts. It gives you a value back. It gives you the same value back, but it's a more constrained type, which you did not have before. So I think this kind of assertion, maybe that's good to put in your production code. So what I ended up calling it, because ensuring was the kind of thing that returns a result, ensuring if you Call ensuring on 33 and the assertion passes, you get 33. Here, if you call ensuring valid on 
33.0, or you pass it in there, you'll get 33.0 back, but it'll be wrapped in a POSI double, except it won't be wrapped because it's an anyval. Um, but you get that more constrained type. So I thought ensuring works. So let me demo that guy. So this is not released yet. This, is a, this will be in 3.1, which will come out sooner. So that is, uh, oh, I have them right here. So if I say pose int dot ensuring valid uh, x, that I think actually worked. So let's, let's negate it. Um, boom, I got an assertion error because it's actually an assertion. But I put a nice error message in it. So what I think happened is that, and this was sort of one of the insights that I think that I came to very recently, was that it's actually OK to replace your require, which could blow up, uh, with an, a kind of assertion that, that could also blow up, where you create an any valve like this. Because what you changed is this require here is a, an assertion, like the require x is positive infinity. Is that going to always work? I don't know. Depends on what you pass me. Essentially, that kind of assertion is I have no idea if it's going to work or not. So I'm just hopeful. So if I get rid of that kind, then people calling it, I may have like, lots more assertions all over the place, but there will be this kind where it's at a spot where you're sure it's going to always work. And maybe that's better. So that was one of the ideas I thought I'd throw out. And, and like, we'll throw it out, we'll release it, and see if, people, if it actually makes sense to people. But it's a new kind of assertion where you get something back that you didn't have before. And it would replace requires where you don't know if it's going to work with an assertion where you're, um, you know, to the extent possible, you have faith it's going to work. You have confidence it's going to work. OK, so that's ensuring valid. And I already demoed it. So um, another thing that, that Bertrand Meyer mentioned in his book is that it's uh, like PAQ is, is closest to that of a predicate. But he said the assertion language that we shall use in Eiffel has only part of the power of the full predicate calculus. So I mentioned that the semicolon means and. So you have the, the a without the thing. But you actually don't have an or, and you don't have a not. And you don't have a for all, and you don't have it exists. Right? So you're missing some of that stuff. Um, and that was also true in Scala test uh, matchers. Um, if you take three matcher expressions, one on each line, uh, or you just put them together on the same line with semicolons, that's an implicit and, just like in Eiffel, because it's an assertion, the same thing. Um, but there's no way to say or, and people have asked for that. Uh, so I, 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 there's no way to or one. And there's, you can not, inside the match, you can say d dot value should not be empty. That's nodding be empty. But you can't take d dot value should be, not be empty and negate that somehow. right? So one of the uh, things that I'd always thought, well, I wonder if there should be a kind of assertion that returns a result instead of throwing an exception when it fails. Because then you could compose them more. I mean, you could make an or for assertions, but you'd have to catch two exceptions and then throw in another one or not. You know, it just seems like the wrong tool for the job. It always seemed wrong to me. Even though people had asked for this, I, I always said no. But I thought about, like, well, could there be something else uh, that could do that? And what um, I finally decided to release something in 3.2, which is called expectations. And I made room for this over the years because expect is a kind of assertion that returns a, a value, whether it succeeds or fails. It doesn't ever throw an exception. And when in Skaltest 1.0, expect was meant something else. So I deprecated that and, and eventually removed it so that it would be available for this if I decided to put it in. But basically, Assert has type assertion, which is always going to be the succeeded value unless it blows up with an exception. Um, expect has type expectation, which is uh, a type alias for fact, this thing called fact. And a fact is either yes or no. It's really like an observation of what happened. Um, so what that might look like, let me give you a quick demo, is I have to import expectations. Um, I can say, I've still got x, right? So I can say expect x is greater than third, well, 0. And it says, yes, 33 was greater than 0. So it's like an observation of what happened. And one way to think of it is like Boolean with error messages. But instead of true, it's yes. And instead of false, it's, it's yes, comma, something, some fact. Instead of false, it's no, comma, something. Um, 
but it, it always says, I mean, the, the English part always says what it observed, right? So if I say, if my expectation is different, if I say x is not greater than equal to 0, I'm expecting the opposite. Um, now it's a no, because it failed, but the, the observation is the same. Um, so that's how that looks. And then um, <coughs> it's, I said it was like Boolean with error messages, but it's really like predicate logic with error messages. Because Boolean logic is a subset of predicate logic. And so what, on a fact, or an, uh, on type expectation, these first five things are just the Boolean operator. So double ampersand is, is, the, is the and that short circuits. So if the first one is false, it doesn't execute this, the, the second one. In case there's a side effect, it would not happen. Um, there is also a single ampersand on Boolean that does both sides no matter what. Even if the first one is false, it does the, the right-hand side. So that's on expectation. It's on fact. Uh, double pipe is or and short circuit. Single pipe does not short circuit, just like Boolean. And then the uh, exclamation point, just like Boolean, that's the sideways L. That's not. But on top of that, there's, there's two little symbols for implies and is equivalent to. It, and that's th those two operators. So that's if then is implies and if and only if is is equivalent to, essentially. Um, and then there's, there's no for all or exists on expectation, but in Scala tests there are several for alls. There's one in inspectors, like if you have a collection of uh, uh, elements, one to ten in a list, you can say for all x's, x should be greater than zero, and that will be true. Or if you say x should be less than zero, it will throw an exception, right? Um, so there's for all there, there's a for all with table driven property checks, there's a for all with generator driven property checks, which is just like generators. Um, and those really say for all, but we don't test everything. We just test some of the values, right? But it allows you to say in your test that, you know, that's the specification. And then there's also a for at least in inspectors, where you can say for at least one, or for at least three x's, x should be greater than three, right? You can say that about a list. Um, if you say for at least one, which is most of the times what people say, that's the existential quantifier for at least one. So I actually made an, an alias exist, which means for at least one. And if what's inside of the for all or the exist is an assertion, then you get an assertion as the result of for all or exists. If what's inside there is an expectation, then you get an expectation. So these things compose up. Um, OK, and then there's one other thing that I did want to, at one point, de deprecate must because I wanted to, one is I thought it was like too close to should, and I should, didn't want to have two ways to do it. And the other one was to, so I could come back as, as the kind of a s match or expression that returns a result rather than throw an exception. Um, and I remember asking Jonas Bonaire, the guy who created Akka, you know, would that be OK? Because I know you use must. And he goes, oh, I prefer must, but I guess it doesn't matter. So that's what he said. So I was like, OK. And I asked around, and people were like, oh, OK, whatever. You know. Uh, but boy, when I did it, I had sort of a mini revolt. Uh, it's like, what? Must? If I don't want to like, use should because it sounds like wishy-washy. Um, so it turns out it did, it did actually mean something different to users. So I, uh, I put it back in, and I, I, I called it a resurrection. So I had deprecated it first, and then I resurrected it by removing at deprecated. So then I was like, well, shoot, what am I going to use for for like the kind of match or expression that returns a result instead of throwing an exception. And, and uh, one of the people who revolted was uh, the other guy in the Aka team, Victor Klang. And he suggested will. I had never thought of that. So it actually fits. So now there's will matchers, which are the kind of matchers that return a result. They have type expectation, and they either return yes or no. So, um, so I can show you a couple demos. First, I can just show you a quick will. Whoops. Uh, you can say x is 33. x will be greater than 0. That returns yes. If you say will not, I'm going to have to put prints here, will not be greater than 0, then it's that no. right? Um, so it's, it's uh, and these guys, you can compose them with those other operators. So I could say uh, x, whoops, I can say that. Let's go to this guy. x will be greater than 0. And x will be less than 100, right? That actually succeeds. And then they just compose as big as you want. So they have and, or, not, the things that matchers didn't have, right? And one of the things that I was trying to solve is that matchers 
were kind of an ex a social experiment to see if people would like in their code, where it kind of reads like English in the code. And then the error message, I just wanted to be English. So if you like, say, uh, x should be, well, be less than 0, then you get this error message that this might be what you would say to somebody next to you. It's like, oh, 33 was not less than 0. And then if you compose them, so I say it should be less than 0 or be greater than 100. That's not b. Be greater than 100, right? Oh, that's the wrong or, sorry. Or, um, it says 33 was not less than 0 and 33 was not greater than 100, right? So it would compose these English. The trouble is it doesn't scale very well. So if I do another one, like say, let's do something that's true. Uh, be greater than 10, that's true, right? And be less than 100. So let's put friends here. Then you get the right error message. But 33 was not less than 0, and 33 was greater than 10, but 33 was not greater than 100. That English statement sort of, you lose where the parentheses were, right? So it doesn't scale up very well. Uh, most math expressions are small and it works, but you know, in the 95% case, but then it doesn't scale up very well. So what, uh, and the same thing is true with assertions. There's, there's a, originally matchers where the way you get nice error messages. But once macros came in, in, we started doing this kind of thing with assertion. So we changed this to assert x less than 0, or let's make it a Boolean expression, x is greater than 10 and x is greater than 100. I think that's right. I get the same error message. So it, you can get them out of assertions now, but they, they have that same kind of scaling problem. So there's one other kind of assertions we added to Scala uh, test, which was um, inspired by um, a language called, I mean, a test framework called Spock for Groovy. Uh, really, really, this guy invented this. So it was just really nice. Now if you, you get a, an ASCII art. So there's no more attempt to make English. Um, it actually shows the line of code that failed. And it just says, here's all the values, right? And you can kind of like trace it. But the problem with this one is that it's, it goes horizontal. So if you get off the screen, then they get all mixed up. And if it goes on multiple lines, it doesn't work. So like if I just actually insert right here, let's say, let's finish at 100. Uh, we detect that and just switch back to the other one. Right, it doesn't scale. So what these guys are, if I go back to my expect, it, it was an attempt to actually so, do, do something that scales. Because you can just, these things are like a combination of diagrams and English. But the English is only in each node. And what, what the structure of the diagram, the diagram goes this way, not this way, um, is predicate logic. Right? I can actually see the structure of the expression there. So I don't, that's sort of another experiment that I'm going to see what if people like that or not. Um, but it, 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 I think it scales better than the others. Uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that's these guys. And then uh, the last demo I want to show you here is uh, here's the Boolean thing. So here, it actually, um, I just, oh, I forgot about imply. So let me go back to this one. Essentially, um, because I'm in a logic spec and I use will here, I, uh, the result of this for all is, is actually type expectation. It's a fact. But because it's last in a logic spec that requires assertion, it implicitly converts it to assertion. It either blows up with an exception or, or doesn't. Right? Um, but this is the, I mean, it's kind of readable. But there's a logic key way to say that. You can use implies. Remember p implies q? Um, so you can say, uh, instead of whenever, I could say you know, this fact, imply, uh, this one implies this one. p implies q. That's more a logic key way to say it. Um, and you can, if you want, since they're values, you can actually, if you like, like your p's and your q's, you can just say, well, p is a fact that is that one, that's q, that's a fact, then p implies q, if you want to do that. Um, and the last one uh, is that I can just actually use double here. Implies does not work on Boolean. I'm sorry, I, I can use Boolean. Implies doesn't work on Boolean, but it will implicitly convert it to expectation that does have implies. And then over here, uh, same thing. 
implies takes another expectation, so it implicitly converts it. So it's, it looks a lot like a, a f in, in Scala check, you, you use Boolean, but you have to put these little smiley faces to get a nice error message. So it's like that, but you don't have to have the smiley faces. You get a nice error message by default. OK, so last thing, the conclusion is that this is, I think, what the essence of testing is, is it's a, a statement, this statement of predicate logic, which is for all x, px implies qx. That's what a test is. But it isn't about proving propositions, which that's what people do use logic for. Um, this is more about like doing experiments and seeing if reality meets your expectation. So if your expectation is for all x, if x is greater than 0, then x plus 1 will be also greater than 0. You actually write that as an assertion. That's your expectation. What the test framework does is it, it sort of performs the experiment like a scientific experiment, and then gives you a, a, a result, like this is what reality is. And in this case, if x is int, then it might say int.max value was greater than 0, but int.min value is not greater than 0, because it, if for ints, that doesn't hold for int.max value, because it'll wrap around to a negative number if you add 1. So, uh, so that's what I think. You know, essentially, it's like uh, a single experiment could prove Einstein's relatively wrong, but no number of experiments can prove it true. And, and you know, these little expectations we write are our hypotheses, and then these are the experiments that sort of tell if, it, if, if they hold so far, essentially. OK, so that's, uh, that's my talk. Does anybody have a question? Thank you. Yes. I think your presentation was great. Uh, I, I learned about Scala. I wanted to ask you a question about most of the programming languages are written in English, and most of the programmers come from India, India or China. And uh, they, they have a background in their own local language, uh, which is like uh, in India, it will be Sanskrit or Hindi or in China, with Mandarin, or, uh, or their own language. And they have very high quality uh, logic background at high school level. If you were to convert your, what you're saying today is, uh, is to incorporate people who are trained very well at high school, better than what they graduate in bachelor's or master's program. And you have to come up with it, something where they write in their own language, mm -hmm. uh, which is like, uh, uh, you know, like you said, x is less than 0, x is higher than 0. Uh, they all understand that. Yeah. But they can English, but they don't understand it. So how would you translate when you have to have uh, Scala programming to Mandarin, Hindi. Well, you could actually do that in Scala. So one thing, uh, well, let me repeat the question in case it wasn't heard, was uh, that there are a lot of programmers who don't, aren't native English speakers. And um, um, what, what, uh, what about the idea of having the program expressed more in their language rather than English, essentially? Yeah. Um, um, so. One of the things I did in Scala test, because it is about English in a lot of places, is I, I put all those in internet in, in like a resource bundles so they could be internationalized. But in just eight years, we never did it, and, and I, I I can't. I mean, but it's something that someone could contribute. But it's it's uh, one thing I thought is like that might make sense. Um, didn't seem like there was much demand. Uh, things like if you know it, those things in languages do tend to be in English. And they can be learned, but you can also write an if in Scala in a library and have it be a ideogram if somebody wanted to do that. But I'm not sure that's what people want to that level. Actual error messages in, it might be nice to have in uh, their language. And I've definitely seen Scala tests use where it says, you know, it, you know, like describe an it, but it's in Japanese. Uh, so people do use their language, at least in the, you know, in parts of their Scala programming. Uh, yes. I had a specific question. Like, you mentioned about the 10 days difference for contract, design by contract. 
and uh, we talked a lot about this too. And in design by contract, it's very interesting to know about this required precondition for scripts. Does that mean that the time player didn't really write anything about dashes? Um, I, you know, it's an, his book is really big. So I don't want to say he didn't. Uh, but basically, let me repeat the question. It was, uh, did. Uh, but my philosophy is yes. the question is essentially if we can write the test in the code itself, <coughs> does it make sense to have the test separate from the code? Yeah, I. I uh, the question is, uh, yeah, if, if, it, if you can write the test in the code itself, does it make sense to have it separate? And I think his idea was it, it's better to put it in the code because it's, it just makes it more obvious what the contract is. And I think that's a good idea if I zip back to the Eiffel example without freezing my laptop. Uh, you know, it, if you look at his, like that's what it looks like. It's, it's, it's kind of nice that it's right there because I, I have to think about it, whereas I can just write a method in Scala and not think about it. But it just didn't take off. It, didn't, uh, it wasn't what was adopted in the marketplace of ideas. The marketplace of ideas, for whatever reason, they said, you know, put your assertions off to the side. I think that's what fun, but uh, yeah. I mean, so the first question, like, I presume that is like that is he adds something else for the test to be separate. I don't know. That's why I say I don't. I don't want to say because I his I read his book a long time ago, and I just reread the chapter on design by contract in prep of this talk. So there may be other things he he wrote about that. But he he I think if you do this, maybe maybe you don't need tests, right? They're right there. So I think that was his idea, and it just uh, the the part that did actually succeed is the require part. Everybody does that. We just don't do this part. Uh, so the yeah. follow-up question is like, since Galactic is like a library which yeah. can be used not just in say a test code, but in say a production code. So if I apply the same question to Scala code and use this Galactic, does it mean that the correct like a canonical or recommended way is to use it in production code, but not in the test? Code? No, well, Scalactic has got a require, but it doesn't have an insure. <laughs> it doesn't, okay. but Scala does. Really because I actually, it, it is opinionated. I think you should use require, but, if, but think about, can I put it in the type? But the post conditions, I think, should be in tests. Okay. I sort of, that's my opinion. And I think that's what, that's what sort of was the mainstream opinion. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to do it. Like, never says for neuroconditioning, you don't have a handle. Yes, any other questions? Yes. Does for all really work with the double? And yeah. If so how should, should it work with the double, given the likely sampling? OK, so that's a, the question is, does for all work with double, and should it? Or how should it work? That's a good question. Um, so there's, there's a couple. There's, Skultis has three for alls. One's for a, a collection, for all elements. Another is a table, like you can make a little pretty table, and you say for all the rows. And then there's just for all doubles. Uh, that's the one you saw somewhere here, uh, like right here, for all doubles. That one, it, there's an implicit generator pass that generates doubles. So that's how that works. And ScalaCheck does that. And I've been working on a Scala test generator also. Um, and so I actually was faced with that question. And, and for example, should it present not a number? I don't think ScalaCheck does, but I actually think it should. Oh, what's that? You, you, get a, you, get a, you throw an exception to five. So how would that, like, that kind of test for all doubles, would, you'd be unlikely to get a good test? It's, it's actually tricky. I, I was doing just some of these tests uh, in a project recently, and I kept getting not a number and overflow, and it's like I had to like reduce the size of the doubles to use, because it was doing some math inside it, and I didn't know where it was going to overflow or not. And so at the end of it, I got it to work, but I'm like, it wasn't very, uh, it was just kind of like I got it to work. It wasn't, I didn't feel right about it. I felt wrong, I felt dirty about it. Because it's like, well, am I actually, well, I guess I felt is I wonder if I'm excluding actual bugs, yeah. right? Yeah. So, anybody else? Yes. OK, so for all, uh, does, does it, does it, uh, generate the same sequence of numbers for different test runs. It does not. Um, but what, I, what is important is actually that you can reproduce it if the test fails. So that's not in Scala test yet, but we want to add a flag where you can say use this seed. 
So what I think is going to happen is every test in one run will use the same seed. And if it, if it prints out, well, maybe I haven't actually implemented that yet, but uh, that was what I was thinking, but I just had a different idea. But basically, when, the, when one of these tests fails, it needs to say this was the seed. And then you need to be able to say, rerun the test using that seed, and you get it again. Uh, but it's turned in by the seed. It's a pseudo-random generator that does it. If you use the same seed, you'll get the same ones. But if you don't specify what the seed should be to reproduce a, a previous failure, then it's just going to say, hey, give me a seed based on the current time. And it's different every time. So yeah. For a random sample of? Yes, that's what it. That's what it does. Well, yeah, that's what for all means. So in, in this for all, it actually means for random sample, but for all is, yeah. <laughs> anyway, any other questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming here in the rain, and. Uh, Enjoy Scala.